Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Tina koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi aroha kia koutou. Ko Moira Clooney toku ingoa. As Robert said, I'm from the Mental Health Foundation and along with my colleague Witi Ashby, I manage Suicide Prevention Information New Zealand. I wanted to talk today about the research evidence around LGBT TTI wellness and suicide. I'm going to use the term sexual and gender minorities throughout this as a collective description for our community or other terms where they're used in the research that I refer to. So this event asks what do we need to change? I guess my kaupapa today is to lay out why we might need to change things and what some of those changes could possibly look like based on the research evidence. But first a little bit about where I'm from. The Mental Health Foundation focuses on creating a society where all people can flourish. So flourishing is an international descriptor for mental well-being or positive mental health, not just the absence of a mental illness diagnosis, but a positive state of being well. When someone's flourishing, they experience positive emotions, positive interest and engagement with the world around them, and meaning and purpose in their lives most of the time. This is not just a feel-good aspiration. Evidence suggests that on a personal level, people who are flourishing experience better physical and mental health, less risk of problems. And on a national level, New Zealand could be more productive, have lower rates of social problems and physical illness if we had higher levels of mental well-being. As a community, flourishing would mean cohesion, support, and the ability to work together to get things done. One of the tools we work with is the Five Ways to Wellbeing, developed by the New Economics Foundation in the UK. Commissioned to develop an equivalent to the five plus a day fruit, um, fruit and vegetables type of campaign to improve people's mental well-being, they came up with these five action areas, all supported by strong evidence that everyone can do to improve their well-being. So they are giving to others through volunteering or through generous relationships, being active physically, keeping learning throughout your life, connecting with others, and taking notice of what's around you, appreciating the small things, cultivating mindfulness. We focus on flourishing for all sorts of reasons, but one of those is that it's population level suicide prevention. Mentally healthy and resilient people with good social supports are less likely to, to die by suicide. But suicide prevention is a range of activities that build resilience as well as supporting people who are at more immediate risk of suicide. It includes population level activities to reduce overall risk in the community or in specific groups, care for individuals who are at risk, effective intervention and support for people who attempt suicide or who reach a crisis point, and care for people in communities who are bereaved. Across the range of these activities, our Suicide Prevention Information New Zealand service provides good quality, safe and evidence-based information to support organisations, professionals, family, media, policy makers and others who have a role to play in suicide prevention. So that's who we are, why are we interested in LGBTI wellbeing in particular? Well, a flourishing Aotearoa obviously means, the right, means that everyone deserves the right to flourish but sexual and gender minorities are at a disadvantage here. A needs assessment rep report published last year by TAPO as part of the government's Suicide Prevention Research Fund found that GLBTI people have significantly poorer mental health and higher rates of suicide, suicidal behaviour than other New Zealanders. The study looked at the local and international evidence around LGBTI mental health, while noting that that local evidence is, is fairly limited, particularly for Māori and Pacific populations. It cites a range of studies that have found a higher lifetime risk for mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, suicidal behaviour and self-harm, substance misuse and eating disorders. One example of those is the Christchurch Health and Development Study, a major longitudinal study that follows people over the course of, of their life, which found in 2005 that predominantly homosexual men had over five times the rate of mental health problems compared with exclusively heterosexual men, including suicide attempts and suicidal ideation. So 28.6% of gay men reported attempting suicide compared with 1.6% of straight men. 76.4% reported suicidal ideation compared with 10.9% of straight men. And lesbians had about 30% higher rates of major depression compared with heterosexual women. The Youth 2000 project at the University of Auckland is another, uh, is another major study in this area that's conducted three large scale population health studies of secondary school students across the country. The 2001 and 2007 studies asked questions about sexual attraction and coming out. In the 2007 report, almost all same-sex or both sex-attracted students reported positive and caring relationships with their parents and that they were happy or satisfied with life. 
However, the study also found that students attracted to the same or both sexes were less likely to feel happy or satisfied compared with their opposite sex attracted partners. This is the language that they used. Um, more likely to be using alcohol and drugs at a problematic level and to have sexually transmitted infections and significantly more likely to report depressive symptoms, deliberate self-harm or suicidal thoughts and behaviours. Same-sex attracted students were three times as likely to report serious thoughts of suicide and five times as likely to report an actual suicide attempt in the past year compared with opposite sex attracted students. 20% of same-sex attracted students said that they had made a suicide attempt in the previous year. The follow-up Youth 2012 study, which hasn't been published yet, um, conducted last year, included questions about transgender identity as well. So the same patterns are noted internationally. Research in Australia, the UK and the US has found higher rates of mental health problems across the lifespan. To highlight a few examples, for example, the um, Stonewall Healthy Lives work in the UK looked at the health of gay, lesbian and bisexual people in particular. It found that young men and bisexual, young gay and bisexual men were six times more likely to have attempted suicide in the past year compared with straight men of the same age. 3% of gay men and 5% of bisexual men reported a suicide attempt in the previous year. Lesbians and bisexual women were five times more likely to engage in deliberate self-harm in the last year. Um, so 20% of women under 20 had harmed themselves compared with one in 15 teenagers generally. Rates were generally significantly higher for bisexual women compared with lesbians as well. In Australia, the National LGBTI Health Alliance, Australia's Mind Out project, um, summarised the Australian evidence in, in a really useful briefing paper, noting, for example, that at least 36.2% of trans people and 24.4% of gay, lesbian and bisexual people currently met the criteria for experiencing a major depressive episode, compared with 6.8% of the general population, so around four to five times as many. And this rate soars to 59.3% of trans women under 30 in one study. The Private Lives Research is a national Australian study of the health and well-being of GLBT Australians, and it's been repeated in Private Lives too for comparison over time. This found overall poorer mental health compared with the general population and also marked variations in overall mental health and levels of psychological distress within the sample according to gender identity, sexual identity and age. So this study suggested that trans males and trans females reported the highest level of psychological distress followed by bisexual women and men and then followed by same-sex attracted men and women. Nearly 80% of the sample had experienced at least one episode of intense anxiety in the past 12 months. The Trans Nation study looked at more detail in more detail at issues for trans people in Australia and New Zealand through a self-selected online study and it found that most respondents had happy and satisfying lives but also found some concerning that one in four respondents reported serious suicidal thoughts in the previous two weeks. I should say we don't have very clear data on how many LGBTI individuals in New Zealand are depressed or die by suicide or anything tidy like that. Sexuality and gender diversity are not counted at population level within health services. They don't feature in coronial data related to suicide deaths. They're not recorded in the census and it's related disability survey. They're not necessarily disclosed or known to friends or family. So we have limited data in this area particularly for Māori and Pacific LGBTI people and those from recent immigrant cultures. And there's a real lack of data on intersex people, though overseas research suggests that intersex adults have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviours than the general population. We do have data on suicide and mental health for other demographic groups, um, which are a little bit easier to count. Just briefly in terms of suicide, men are more likely than women to die by suicide. So in 2010, the male rate was 2.5 times the female rate. Significant, uh, suicide rates are significantly higher for Māori, particularly for young Māori. So in 2010, the Māori rate for the whole population was 1.5 times the non-Māori rate. And for young people, the Māori youth rate was two and a half times non-Māori. In terms of age, rates are quite similar between adults and youth. However, New Zealand's youth suicide rates are high compared with similar countries. And Suicide is a more significant um, means of death for young people. There's less, there are less causes of, of death for 
people between 15 and 24. And in terms of location, male rates were higher in, in rural compared with urban areas in 2010. So generally, suicide rates are higher in areas of higher socioeconomic deprivation as well. Um, it's important when talking about risk factors and at-risk groups, particularly around suicide, to realise that none of these things predict suicide. So depression greatly increases a person's risk of suicide, but depression is common, and almost everyone who experiences depression won't die by suicide. Almost everyone who is bullied or excluded or feels alone won't die by suicide. Almost everyone who seriously considers killing themselves won't die by suicide. Suicidal ideation is reasonably um, common compared with, with death. Some of the things we know are protective factors against suicide include connectedness to family, culture and community, personal coping and problem solving skills, belief in a positive future, and community and social integration. The Tepo needs assessment I mentioned earlier also looks at benefits to wellbeing of being part of the GLBTI population. Positive aspects included in, identified in one study included belonging to a community, creating families of choice, having strong connections with others, serving as positive role models, having personal insight and a sense of self, being authentic and honest, having empathy and compassion for others, promoting social justice, and being active and advocating for gay and lesbian rights, and achieving more equality in relationships. We'll likely hear, hear more from Associate Professor Mark Hendrickson later on about his work in the area of identi identity satisfaction across the lifespan. There's a danger, I think, in conflating the experience of being a sexual or gender minority with suicide. Until recently, a large proportion of LGBTI characters in films and books died by suicide. And these days, still, some of the narratives coming out of the It Gets Better project and other community discussions have almost a built-in assumption that to be a queer or trans young person is to struggle. In fact, the Youth 07 report I mentioned found that most same-sex attracted young people were happy or satisfied with life. Most thought that their school was okay and felt a part of their school community. Most had friends who they felt they could talk to about anything and who cared about them a lot. But yes, there were a disproportionate number who weren't happy and a disproportionate number going through a difficult time. But simply being gay, lesbian or bisexual did not determine those negative outcomes. It's really important to be clear that the negative outcomes that I've talked about are not due to sexual, sexuality or gender identity themselves, but are caused by discrimination and exclusion as key determinants of health. Research has found that exposure to and fear of discrimination and isolation can directly impact on people's mental health, causing stress, psychological distress and suicidality. So this is really important to, to repeat and be clear on, that is being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, takatapui or intersex is not a problem and is not the cause of mental health problems. LGBTI individuals have the same potential to flourish as everyone else. Rather, it's discrimination and social inclusion that cause mental health problems. So, for example, the Youth 07 study found that the health and well-being of many same-sex or both sex attracted students was negatively affected by their social environment. More than half had been hit or physically harmed by another person in the previous 12 months. Of those that had been bullied, a third had been bullied because they were gay or people thought they were gay. And one in five continued to be afraid that someone would hurt or bother them at school. The majority had not come out to others and most same or both sex attracted students felt that they couldn't talk to their family about their sexuality. Twice as many same or both sex attracted as opposite sex attracted students had run away from home overnight. Discriminate, discrimination isn't just a youth problem and it's wide ranging, it can be structural or individual. The LGBTI Health Alliance briefing paper I mentioned goes into different types of discrimination and their research links to negative health outcomes. So these include direct violence or bullying, um, homophobia or transphobia in families, communities and work settings, heterosexist discrimination, so those built-in assumptions in society and in law that favour straight people, insults, threats and physical abuse, sexual assault, secrecy and shame um, associated with intersex conditions and the medical procedures that have been associated with those internalised homophobia or a lack of positive self-concept due to growing up in a heterosexist environment, and invisibility through heteronormative assumptions, for example, within education or in services like primary health or mental health. And on the other side of things, acceptance can be explicitly 
protective. So a 2011 Australian study found that supportive family responses to coming out reduced the risk of suicide or self-harm behaviours. Various studies have found links between supportive school environments and less risk. For example, in the States, having gay-straight alliances and anti-discrimination policies in schools has been linked to better me mental health outcomes for students. And there's some evidence that older LGBTI people exhibit a type of crisis competence. So they're more likely to have higher levels of resilience and well-being, reflecting their experience of having lived through a lot of different, different things and finding different ways to, to cope through difficult situations often. So again, research is clear that simply being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, takatapui or intersex, queer or questioning or any other version of sex or gender diverse is not what causes elevated risk of poorer mental health outcomes. Discrimination is a key determinant of ill health and acceptance is protective. So what do we need to change? I'm suggesting that we need to prioritise inclusion and challenge discriminatory structures and attitudes. The social experience that so many experience, social exclusion that so many experience is a key determinant of mental health outcomes. Homophobia, transphobia and other forms of discrimination are not problems with an individual. They're social problems and they need to be tackled at that level. The TIPO needs assessment pointed to the need for mental health promotion at four broad levels. So strengthening individuals' self-esteem, self-efficacy, life and coping skills, relationships and social connections. At an organisational level, strengthening organisations to ensure environments are inclusive, safe and supportive. Strengthening communities to increase social cohesion, social participation and inclusion. And strengthening whole societies through interventions designed to counter stigma and discrimination and reduce inequalities. The study suggests we need a broad approach to enhancing mental, emotional and social wellbeing at whole population level, rather than focusing on preventing mental illness for individuals. So looking at those four levels in reverse, strengthening whole societies through interventions designed to counter stigma and discrimination. Um, currently we're seeing a challenge to legal discrimination at a national level through the Marriage Amendment Bill. So the Mental Health Foundation supported this bill as we think a flourishing Aotearoa requires equal citizenship. The bill would remove barriers to full participation in family and community, continuing the good work of homosexual law reform, the Human Rights Act and civil unions legislation. Law changes can contribute to changes in social attitudes. The Tipo report suggests public awareness campaigns to address stigma, homo stigma, homophobia and transphobia are part of that. So Beyond Blue in Australia ran an interesting social marketing campaign last year targeting homophobia and transphobia, asking people to consider these attitudes in comparison with discriminating against someone for being left-handed. So its tagline is, imagine being, imagine being made to feel crap for being left-handed. It's the same for lesbian, gay, bi, transgender and intersex people. The things we say and do cause anxiety and depression. In New Zealand, Rainbow Youth's WTF campaign is taking on the same issues with a few more swear words. Uh, the Tipo Needs Assessment identified a need for mental health promotion targeted towards the LGBT, the GWTI population and components within mainstream mental health promotion programs um, such as Like Minds Like Mine and the National Depression Initiative to destigmatise mental health issues within the GWTI community. In Australia, the National LGBTI Health Alliance is developing a mental health promotion framework for the LGBTI um, community which would, population which would address um, similar sorts of concerns. So the second area of focus is strengthening communities to increase social cohesion, social participation and inclusion. Challenging discrimination at a community level is a broad task that, that many of us are involved in. Initiatives include diversity education in schools, for example, the great work that Rainbow Youth does in this area. Mental health promotion and suicide prevention is not just about in supporting individual queer and trans young people through difficulties, that's an important part of it. But it's also about challenging and removing the discrimination in their environment that's causing the difficulties in the first place. The Tipo report also talks about the importance of social acceptance and connection and the need for GLBTI people to address issues within their own communities relating to, support com relating to supporting community members. Um, some of that's about bringing the community together. So I mean, possibly an example we saw of that recently was, was Auckland Pride. The third area of, um, of work for mental health promotion is strengthening organisations to ensure environments are safe, inclusive and supportive. So looking at mental health services, 
access to mental health services and the competency of those services in supporting LGBTI clients are two key issues. The TIPO needs assessment report points to the need for mental health services to be provided in a culturally safe and appropriate way. For GLBTI people, this may relate to issues associated with sexual or gender diversity or body diversity, as well as ethnic identity. So staff having appropriate attitudes, skills and abilities to work, work with sex and gender diverse clients was key. In Auckland, the Let's Talk About Sex project has done some great work in this area. So um, Auckland DHB worked with Affinity Services and Outline to produce this report. And they surveyed the experience of mental health um, service users and developed best practice guidelines around how mental health services can provide um, culturally competent services to our community. And it worked with Affinity to train their staff and now to roll this training out within an organisational development model across other NGOs and mental health services across the DHB area. The project drew on local research as well as a number of international studies on best practice in providing services to, to LGBTI people. So um, some, of the, some of the issues brought up through this research are building, building sort of soft skills and organisational capacity through LGBTI cultural competence training. So this includes staff asking about sexuality or gender identity in appropriate ways and being prepared to deal with those issues as they impact on mental health without stigmatising them. Ensuring a, a welcoming, inclusive and accessible space for clients. Um, demonstrating inclusiveness through things like posters and visible policies and literature that's available for people to see. And ensuring questions on forms that you fill out are suitable. So some of these things are not, uh, um, not expensive or difficult to do. They're just a matter of thinking about things in a different way. The TIPO report also pointed to the need to strengthen specific services for GLBTI people. Um, the fourth area is around strengthening individuals' self-esteem, self-efficacy, life and coping skills, relationship and social connections. And this is a role for everyone. This is something that we can all, we can all think about our responsibility in this area. Um, and that comes, comes right back around to strengthening individuals also means strengthening ourselves. This comes full circle back to the five ways to wellbeing that I, talk, that I started with. I encourage you to think about these for yourself and to look at any work that you do with the community through a wellbeing lens. Anything that you can do to promote community, generosity, physical activity, taking notice or lifelong learning will contribute to building a community that's more resilient, more supportive and flourishing. So to finish, thank you for your time. Um, we have a resource table just outside um, the room here with some free resources to take. Um, please come and talk to me after this or contact us later if you want references to any of the research I've talked about today or if you want to continue the conversation. I'm really looking forward to the workshops this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Moira. Um, just re regarding the statistics, um, have you seen any of the stuff that came out a little while ago now from the Christchurch Health and Development Study around um, suicidal ideation and, and um, sexual orientation, gender identity issues? And the, the reason I think it's, it's important was I think that the um, people around that study were reasonably reluctant to actually make any comments at all on sexual orientation and gender identity and it wasn't until these until they pulled these stats out of it that you know, the School of Medicine there actually uh, reorientated itself a little bit. I think they're really important and they, they, they slot really well in the material that you've got there as well. Yeah, I didn't have a picture of the, the study up on my slides, but um, I think I, I mentioned, mentioned that one as one of the examples of, local re of the limited local research that we do have. So found that, um, that predominantly homosexual men had over five times the rate of mental health problems compared with exclusively heterosexual men, those sorts of rates. Um, so it was a significant difference, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering what you thought about the, um, the, the Australian campaigns where they had, you know, government funding for these resources because 
we have all the evidence, technically, but no visibility. Um, I mean, how do you feel the Mental Health Foundation can move forward to help us to, to sort of get those significantly charged campaigns recognised on that government level, sort of like up, like getting people giving us uh, our community, whether it's, I don't, I'm not saying that our organisations have to do it, but somebody's doing it, that they're recognising that that cost needs to be, um, that, that we need help with that <laughs> from, from, from someone in a ministry somewhere, I presume. <laughs> Kia ora, good question. Um, the campaign that I highlighted with Beyond Blue, I don't believe had government funding. Actually, that was funded by the Movember Foundation, which the Mental Health Foundation has a relationship with as well. But that's an initiative that they'd developed in partnership with the community that had had um, private philanthropic funding. But I think for the Mental Health Foundation, we're really keen to partner with um, with the community and look at ways of, of developing specific resources and campaigns. And so I'm interested to see what comes out of the workshops this afternoon and um, what, what the recommendation of the community is around the direction forward. So I think we can put some visibility behind it, but, it, but the initiative probably really needs to come from the community. Hi, Moira. Were you able to find, um, with your statistics either nationally or internationally, if there was any difference um, with the suicide attempts or ideation between people who were either closeted or out, or those who were being bullied or um, those who were supported? Um, I know that, there, yeah, that's, that's sort of quite a complicated question and there's a lot of been a lot of different studies around that. I know that um, being out at a young age has, is sometimes identified as a risk factor. Um, but then, as I was highlighting that Australian study, um, positive responses from people to coming out was explicitly protective. So that um, had, had the effect of reducing suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So I think generally the research supports that being in a supportive environment and being able to be out um, as a positive thing. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, it talk, everybody talks about youth and, and that's absolutely wonderful. What concerns me is the support for me <coughs> for middle age and older age LGBT, and in particular, the transgender. If one realizes that the average age <coughs> for somebody coming out as transgender is actually 42. Mm. In, like myself, many of us don't come out till much later. And we don't have any idea, unless that person understands who they are as to whether they take suicide because because people just don't know. We don't know the figures. There mm -hmm. aren't any that I, my research has done. And um, I'm just wondering what the mental health... You see, um, for me, I'm a trans woman and nobody knew for 60 years. Mm. It's taken me that long to come to terms with who I am. And so many times I thought about suicide. And the job that I had, I did a lot of traveling. And so many times the feeling was such that it would be so easy to just pull in front of that logging truck it would be over. But the important point is that nobody ever would have known. Mm. We don't know, and I don't know how we find out whether people are, and I think it's worse for transgender, and particularly worse for transgender that go from male to female. Mm. Because um, the, the, the issue that 
that seems to be very, very difficult is where society can seem to accept a female being in a male guise. For a male to become in a female guise is so very, very much harder. Mm. It's the concept of a, a man in a dress. And to overcome that is very, in fact, the truth is I don't know why I'm still here. Because there's so many times I have seriously thought of doing something. Because it simply becomes too hard. Mm -hmm. It's still hard. So the question is, what, uh, is anybody understanding that that is an important part to the suicide situation? I don't know how you find out. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. I'm glad that you are still here. Um, that is absolutely a difficult difficulty in terms of the evidence. Um, I was talking a lot about young people, really because that's the best research that we have in New Zealand. The, those Youth 07 studies are across high schools and their sort of population level, um, and they provide really good evidence. And I mentioned that the 2012 study last year had some questions around gender identity. So I think the question was, um, do you think that you're transgender? And described a few other terms that people might use. And at what age were you when you had these feelings? And um, ask, question, ask questions about coming out as well. So that will provide some good evidence around school students at that age who are already at a point where they are identifying in that way or they're at that point of sort of self-awareness. Um, for older people, you mentioned um, male to female, that, that being at a, possibly at a higher risk or being more difficult, that is supported by the Transnation study that I had up on my slide. So that's an Australian, New Zealand um, study which was of um, self-selected trans people who filled out a form through the internet. So there were quite a number of people who answered the questionnaire, but again, it's people who um, have come out to themselves at least, are in that position of, of being self-aware and identifying as trans and, and wanting to reply to a questionnaire around that. Um, it, is, it is difficult around finding evidence in, around that, and I'm, I'm sure uh, there, are, there are gaps, particularly for people who, who are older. Sorry, that doesn't really answer your question, I don't think, but acknowledge that it's a, yeah, it's a real issue and that there are, um, we use this umbrella term of LGBTI, but I think there are, it, it does seem that there are groups within that who are at higher risk. In a, yeah. Not as far as I know. I believe it asks questions around um, same-sex relationships, but I think that's the extent of it. Someone else in the room might know the answer to that more so than I. Yeah, though again, I mean, if, um, if, you, if, if, if you're not out to yourself, you might not have, have that self-identity and um, you might not want to sort of answer an official form that identifies you that way, but sure. Absolutely, yeah. Hi there. Um, hi, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, how much of a mouthful that LGBTI is to say. Um, have you found that the language we use around um, these themes create barriers for people? And if so, what kind of work is being done to streamline that language? Could this perhaps be a good forum for that conversation to be opened? Possibly so. Um, I attended a one-day symposium in Australia that the National LGBTI Health Alliance put on around mental health and suicide prevention that, as well. And what I was hearing there a lot, especially from organisations supporting youth, was... Uh, SSASGD, which was same sex attracted, sex and gender diverse, which is absolutely inclusive of every possible term, but 
also more opaque. Sure, sure. I think some people maybe don't identify with that as a personal term for themselves, but that is being used a lot um, by a lot of NGOs around the country. Yeah, we could have a workshop about that this afternoon, maybe. Good question. Um, the question raised about the census. Um, many years ago there was a, um, an issue that Paul Spoonley raised about ethnicities and they have added a whole list of ethnicities that acknowledge people. And around um, male and female, um, the question, they're not asking about whether someone is a trans person. And I think that's maybe something that could go from here to actually open that up and advocate for, for our members to have the right to actually fill in the, an, another gap if there's a, a question they put down other on the form, and people can self-identify if they wish to. Mm. Thanks. As I say, I don't really know much about that area. I'm sure it must have been raised at some point with the census people, so somebody else might be more knowledgeable than me about discussions. I really noticed um, that, yeah, the questions were very much around um, civil unions or around that sort of thing. So if you were, for example, a single um, homosexual person, then there's, there would be no evidence coming from that that, that that was your sexuality because, if, yeah, it was all around the civil unions or the relationships, yeah. Mm. Um, you mentioned just briefly in passing um, about having, when people are filling in forms, um, how do you put on a form sensitively um, sexual orientation or gender diversity? It's just because I've got to redesign our, our intake forms. So sure. We're doing it at the moment. <laughs> I wonder if I could defer you to uh, Affinity Services. Michael Stevens over here um, is working on that project, and Joey. We, we say that um, just to have forms designed to the space to be open for the clients to fill the space as they wish. So if you're going to use gender, you don't specify you get people fill in the gender that they choose to identify with the same sexuality and the same relationship. So it's a matter of opening up the space to let people fill in with how they want to be um, I just wanted to add to that briefly too to say that while an open box um, is definitely recommended and Michael and I suggest that a lot we also talk about how having things on forms especially if it's part of an assessment process is partly just a reminder to the worker to kind of involve that um, bring those topics up and try and talk about them sensitively, but also to be really mindful about confidentiality and the complexity around what you what you might choose to put or not put on a form. Um, so we yeah we just have to try and do lots of conversations about um, how to record that information safely, knowing that there's lots of flexibility in some cases around the language and yeah the safety safety concerns for record keeping as well. So yeah, come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Morris.